Good morning. As we gather, we invoke God's peace and God's presence. And we pray, peace be to all who gather here to worship our Creator God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Peace to all those who love this place. We pray for the Creator's peace among all who share this land. And we acknowledge that St. Michael's Anglican Church in Canmore and St. George's in the Pines Anglican Church in Banff are on Treaty 7 territory, the ancestral and traditional territory of the Blackfoot Confederacy, the Kainai, the Pikea, and the Siksika, as well as the Tsutina First Nation and Stony Nakoda First Nation. And we acknowledge the many First Nations, Métis and Inuit, whose footsteps have marked these lands for generations. We are grateful for the traditional knowledge keepers and elders who are still with us today, and also for those who have gone before us. We are co-signators of Treaty 7, which calls us to treat one another and this land with respect and with dignity. So peace be to this place and to all of you. We're gonna pray now the collect for this Sunday in the season of Pentecost. It's the gathering prayer for us as we begin our worship. And we have a moment of silence and then we pray. Almighty God, you've made us for yourself and our hearts are restless until they find their rest in you. May we find peace in your service and in the world to come, see you face to face through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Well, good morning and welcome to our service for this uh, Sunday, the 11th of July. It's the seventh uh, Sunday of Pentecost. Pentecost was the day when God poured out his Holy Spirit on all the people of the world. And today's Bible readings challenge us to think about discipleship and what it means to be a true follower of Jesus. Well, we here have the story of John the Baptist this Sunday, and John the Baptist lost his head to King Herod because he was living out God's will. He was faithful to God. He was being a true disciple, and we're called to live faithfully too, to follow God. And there are many topics in the news for the thinking Christian to note this week. How do we respond as disciples? For example, how do we follow God in the middle of global warming? The recent record-breaking heat and scorching sun in Western Canada has resulted in severe crop damage in British Columbia and in other places. Weather that reminds us that we have a mandate to be good stewards of this planet and to do all we can to be kind and gentle to the planet. And St. Michael's Church in Canmore is trying to do something. They've invested in solar electricity uh, with, along with an agreement with the Bow Valley Green Energy Cooperative. And it's one small thing to help our planet. Another topic, to alleviate frustration of the pandemic, the Calgary Stampede has opened its gates for the crowds, for business and for fun. And we hope and pray as Christians that it won't mean a spike in the infection rate. And tremendous news for us to think and pray about from the federal government with the appointment of Mary Simon as the next Governor General of Canada. This appointment has deep significance. Mary Simon is the first ever Indigenous person appointed as Canada's Governor General. She is the first bilingual Governor General who is bilingual in English and in Inuktitut, and she says she's working very hard to become fluent in French as well. Mary Simon is an incredibly talented and gifted and knowledgeable Indigenous leader who may well help us advance reconciliation in our grieving and fractured country. We need to keep her in our prayers. In our service today, we hope and pray that as we worship together, 
we will draw closer to God by the power of the Holy Spirit. Now you may think that's difficult because we're on Wi-Fi, but we can know and experience God's transformative love and power in worship online. And the Bible tells us in the book of James, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. It's an act where we come closer and then we find God. So I hope that you'll really participate in this service. Sing along with our worship leaders, join in the prayers, actively listen to today's Bible readings. And now let's sing along with Heather Jordan as she leads us in this song of worship, womb of life and source of being, home of every restless heart. First reading is from 2 Samuel chapter 6, starting at the first verse. David again brought together all the able young men of Israel, 30,000. He and all his men went to Bala in Judah to bring up from there the Ark of God, which is called by the name, the name of the Lord Almighty, who is enthroned between the cherubim on the Ark. They set the ark of God on a new cart and brought it from the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill. Uzzah and Ahiah, sons of Abinadab, were guiding the new cart with the ark of God on it, and Ahio was walking in front of it. David and all Israel were celebrating with all their might before the Lord with castanets, harps, lyres, timbrels, sistrums, and cymbals. Now King David was told, The Lord has blessed the household of Obed-Edom and everything he has because of the Ark of God. So David went to bring up the Ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom to the city of David with rejoicing. When those who were carrying the Ark of the Lord had taken six steps, he sacrificed a bull and a fattened calf. Wearing a linen ephod, David was dancing before the Lord with all his might, while he and all Israel were bringing up the ark of the Lord with shouts and the sound of trumpets. As the ark of the Lord was entering the city of David, Michal, daughter of Saul, watched from a window. And when she saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord, she despised him in her heart. They brought the ark of the Lord and set it in its place inside the tent that David had pitched for it. And David sacrificed burnt offerings and fellowship offerings before the Lord. After he had finished sacrificing the burnt offerings and fellowship offerings, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord Almighty. Then he gave a loaf of bread 
a cake of dates and a cake of raisins to each person in the whole crowd of Israelites, both men and women. And all the people went to their homes. Thanks be to God. Today's psalm is Psalm 24. It's a psalm of David. Handel used part of this psalm when he wrote the, the Messiah. Who is this King of glory, he writes. Starting in verse 1. The earth is the Lord's, and everything in it, the world, and all who live in it. For he founded it on the seas, and established it on the waters. Who may ascend the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? The one who has clean hands and a pure heart. Who does not trust in an idol or swear by a false god. They will receive blessing from the Lord and vindication from God their Savior. Such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face, God of Jacob. Lift up your heads, you gates. Be lifted up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty. The Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, you gates. Lift them up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord Almighty, he is the King of glory. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Creator and ruler of all, open our hearts that the kingdom of glory may enter and bring us rejoicing to your holy mountain where you live and reign now and forever. Amen. The second reading is taken from Ephesians chapter 1, starting in the third verse. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ, in accordance with his pleasure and will, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of his sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us. With all wisdom and understanding, he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he proposed in Christ, to be put in effect when the times reach their fulfillment, to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. In him we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will, in order that we, who were the first to put our hope in Christ, might be for the praise of his glory. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory.
Lord be with you. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Mark. Glory to you, Lord Jesus Christ. King Herod heard of it, for Jesus' name had become known. Some were saying, John the baptizer has been raised from the dead, and for this reason these powers are at work in him. But others said, it is Elijah. And others said, it is a prophet like one of the prophets of old. But when Herod heard of it, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised. For Herod himself had sent men who arrested John, bound him, and put him in prison on account of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because Herod had married her. For John had been telling Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And Herodias had a grudge against him and wanted to kill him. But she could not for Herod feared John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man, and he protected him. When he heard him, he was greatly perplexed, and yet he liked to listen to him. But an opportunity came when Herod, on his birthday, gave a banquet for his courtiers and officers and for the leaders of Galilee. When his daughter Herodias came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his guests. And the king said to the girl, "'Ask me for whatever you wish, and I will give it. I will give you even half of my kingdom. She went out and said to her mother, what should I ask for? She replied, the head of John the baptizer. Immediately she rushed back to the king and requested, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. The king was deeply grieved Yet, out of regard for his oaths and for the guests, he did not want to refuse her. Immediately, the king sent a soldier of the guard with orders to bring John's head. He went and beheaded him in the prison, brought his head on a platter, and gave it to the girl. Then the girl gave it to her mother. When his disciples heard about it, they came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. This is the Gospel of Christ. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Hello, friends. Remember me? I'm Teresa. And I'm here in this beautiful vegetable garden today to talk to you about cauliflower. I have always hated cauliflower. I think it hates me too. It always makes me feel sick. My mom would serve cauliflower to my brothers and me. The boys would eat it, but I just couldn't. She tried and she tried again. She told me it would make me strong and healthy, but that didn't make it taste any better. She told me not to be silly, be brave and to eat my cauliflower. Well, 
I did, but I still hated cauliflower. In our Bible story today, we heard about this queen who hated a man named John so much that she had him killed. Now, John was a friend of Jesus. and He was teaching and preaching all the people about Jesus and how to live God's way. John was quite a character. He was big and hairy, probably stinky. He had a loud voice and he told everybody they were sinners and they had to repent. He told the queen she was a sinner too. She hated that and she hated John. But John kept preaching and teaching. He kept trying and trying again. He told everyone how good God was and that living God's way would make them strong and healthy. I think that took a lot of guts. He probably doubted he was getting through to anybody. My mom probably felt that way too about getting through to me about the cauliflower. They both kept trying and trying. John couldn't help the queen, but he taught lots and lots of other people, just like my mom taught my brothers and I to eat the cauliflower. We have to remember to be like John, to be brave. Don't give in to doubts. Keep trying and trying. Remember, God loves you and wants us to live God's way of love and understanding. Well, I hope you all can get out to the gardens this year. Have fun and remember, eat your cauliflower. Goodbye, friends. Good morning. The readings you hear Sundays are not random. We follow what is called electionary. And this means that people across the world and across denominations are all discerning God's word within the same texts. Occasionally, though, there are choices. And I want to read a bit from the alternative Old Testament lesson for today, which is from the book of Amos. And this is what I want to read. This is what the Lord God showed me. The Lord was standing beside a wall built with a plumb line, with a plumb line in his hand. And the Lord said to me, Amos, what do you see? And I said, a plumb line. Then the Lord said, see, I am setting a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel. I will never again pass them by. Yesterday, I had to go to an appointment in Calgary. Unsure of exactly where this place was and how amidst construction I was to access it, I used my handy GPS. And I got to reflecting on how sophisticated GPSs have become. Instructions like, not this set of lights but the next, or stay in the right lane, or speed and red light cameras ahead are so much more helpful than the old recalculating that we once used to hear frequently or those last minute instructions to turn left when we were in the, in the lane three lanes over. If I look back before GPSs, when I first moved to Calgary 30 years ago, I think of trying to memorize a map before setting out. I remember being very grateful for those books you could get that had enlarged maps of specific areas in the city. Calculated measurements are important for so many things in this world, if you think about it, and so we continue to see new and more exact ways to measure. Amos mentions a plumb line. Now, plumb lines date back at least to ancient Egypt and are still used in various forms, including in sophisticated survey equipment and, you know, those long stringy things that uh, you snap and make a line on a flat surface 
Oh, and I remember using a fairly simple plumb line to hang wallpaper. The one I had was basically a string with a weight on the end. You hold up the string and allow the laws of gravity to do the rest. Now, forgive me if in the next few minutes I mix a variety of metaphors, but in reading our gospel today, I thought of a few. The necessary plumb line for building a house that is straight and therefore sound. The building and following of a road and the planting of seed. Last week, the gospel of Jesus was of him not being recognized for who he was in his own town. And then we heard how he sent his disciples out. And next week, we will look at the story of Jesus feeding the 5,000. But in between these two stories is the details of the death of John the Baptist. Normally, we think of Mark as the succinct writer who tends to get straight to the point. You might say there is an immediacy in his writing. In Mark, for example, there's no birth narrative. He gets straight into Jesus' ministry. And the story of the resurrection and the end of his gospel speak of the women running in fear from the empty tomb and telling no one. Yet here in the middle of the stories of Jesus' ministry is a detailed account of a past and ugly tragedy. This is indeed a gruesome story of betrayal and what happens when a weak and self-indulgent person is given absolute power. Imagine the fallout. What does such an act do to further darken a dark soul? What of the young girl Salome? What did this horror do to her? What of the observers? And how did this damage and break the hearts of those who followed John, those who knew and loved John, including his cousin, Jesus? Why this story here? What was Mark getting at? The story begins with Herod hearing of the disciples of Jesus, their call to repentance, their healing, driving out demons, their teaching, their anointing. He has heard of Jesus and his miraculous works. And he has heard that people are saying, among other things, that Jesus is John the Baptist raised from the dead. That must strike fear into his heart and poke at a guilty conscience. Sadly, as we find out later, people like Herod go to a place of self-preservation rather than conscience when confronted by fear and guilt. Herod knew that John was a good man. In fact, he protected him when he was in prison and he listened to him. Unlike some of the people that Jesus warned the disciples they would run into, Herod did hear the words, John did plant the seeds. So what happened? One commentator suggests we look at success versus significance. In this time and place, John was anything but successful, right from the way he looked and had lived prior to being in prison. This unruly, unkempt, imprisoned person with the unpopular message of repentance and straight paths was seen as a huge failure. Sure, he had a following, but there wasn't any army to rescue him or people with influence to have him released. Where had his message and lifestyle gotten him? Prison. Unsuccessful would be an understatement. However, Herod's abode was among the successful. The chiefs of state, the military brass, the power brokers, the leaders. They lived in opulence. These people knew what leisure and pleasure were all about. They got what they wanted when they wanted it. Yes, they were successful. If you think about it in today's world, there aren't very many biblical figures who are known to people, even people in the church. But John the Baptist is remembered with some detail. He was indeed significant. He sp spoke truth to power. His message of repentance and as in Amos's plumb line, making our way straight is still the path to take today. It is a timeless message, still being the way to God through Jesus. This gospel story points out the stark contrast between success and significance. As the commentator said about this, the gospel here invites us to look closely at success, 
then choose significance as we follow Jesus on his way. The straight way, I might add. As John before them, Jesus' disciples were teaching a message of repentance. And this must also have struck a chord with Herod. Through John, Herod had heard the word. John had sown the seeds, but unlike John, his overwhelming need for self-preservation and saving of face, his inability to admit when he was wrong, led to the heinous act of John's brutal murder. The seeds John had sowed were choked out by the weeds of power and success in the world in which Herod lived. Repentance isn't a popular message. Don't we prefer to focus on the good, focus on the positive? Life is complicated and tough, and we're just trying to get by. We need church to make us feel better, not challenge us, right? However, if you think about it, sometimes the things that challenge us most are the most significant accomplishments in our lives. In our prayer books are morning, midday, evening, and Compline prayers, along with the Eucharist. All these liturgies contain a confession. So if you're praying the daily office and praying each of these services each day, you're saying the confession quite a few times. The Anglican liturgies have been criticized for being too penitential, too much beating ourselves up. Repentance isn't meant to be an exercise in making us feel badly. Repent means to turn around. It is about direction. There are so many ways in a day to get turned around, to lose sight of God. It is so easy to get caught up in various ways of being or not being, sometimes without even realizing it. Sometimes things come to light that point out errors of the past, ways that require thoughtful consideration of complicity, carelessness, ignorance, and indulgence. All these things call for repentance. Regular repentance is a gift. It is the nudge in the right direction. It's hands on shoulders turning to face us in the right direction. It requires humility and curiosity and doesn't leave a lot of room for excuses or justifications. Rather than walking miles in the wrong direction, frequent repentance provides constant correction. It's like regularly checking a compass and making slight corrections rather than allowing several wrong turns to get us good and truly lost. In speaking of repentance, what John was asking was to turn away from anything and everything that gets in the way of our absolute allegiance to Christ and flatten and make straight the way to a life with God that transcends politics and worldly success. I began by asking why Mark has placed this story here. It comes on the heels of Jesus sending out the disciples, as the scripture says, so they went out and proclaimed that all should repent. They cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and cured them. Following this narrative, we are then given an example of the extreme cost of discipleship through the story of John's gruesome death. Now, I come, someone that comes to mind as I think about this is Oscar Romero, the bishop in El Salvador, who was shot while celebrating the mass because of his criticism of the military government of El Salvador. As a bishop in the Roman Catholic Church, he could have been somewhat protected, but he preached liberation for the poor and believed in social revolution based on an interior reform. He was murdered for upholding and promoting Christian values that ran contrary to the current government, and he was murdered in a public and sacrilegious way that made a very direct point. Now, most of us won't end up in prison or tortured or murdered because of our belief, but it can be hard to follow the plumb line, that straight path. It may mean taking an unpopular stance, and it may involve personal sacrifice. But first and foremost, it means knowing Jesus Christ. In other words, having a living relationship with Jesus who loves us and wants the best for us. 
It is seeking Christ's guidance through the leading of the Holy Spirit rather than going off as lone wolves. Here's a modern day parable I heard. There were two brothers in Georgia during the 1950s. One decided that in opposition to the dominant culture of the day, he was going to support and participate in the formation of a multi-ethnic community. The other worked as an attorney for a prominent law firm. Both were Christians and attended church regularly. As the multi-ethnic community formed and social pressure, remember it was the 1950s, forced them into court proceedings, the one brother asked his attorney brother to help him with the legal work. The brother refused, saying that he could lose his job. The pressure increased to help with a reminder that he was a Christian. The lawyer responded, I will follow Jesus to his cross, but it is his cross. I have no need to be crucified. To this, his brother replied, then you are an admirer of Jesus, but not his disciple. It is one thing to gladly hear what Jesus has to say and to admire, even agree with Jesus. After all, Herod did all that. Rather than just learning about Jesus and scripture, we have been given the free invitation to know God as God is revealed in Jesus. It is about knowing and being known by God. It involves our hearts as well as our intellects. Our relationship with God through Jesus involves our lives in full. The bottom line for Mark is that he wants us to become disciples, and today he offers an intense window into the life of a disciple. Discipleship is, as Bonhoeffer not only knew but lived, is costly, but it is also grace. This is what Bonhoeffer said about discipleship. Costly grace is the gospel which must be sought again and again and again. The gift which must be asked for. The door at which a man must knock. Such grace is costly because it calls us to follow And it is grace because it calls us to follow Jesus Christ. It is costly because it costs a man his life. And it is grace because it gives a man the only true life. It is costly because it condemns sin and grace because it justifies the sinner. Above all, it is costly because it cost God the life of his son. You were bought at a price. And what has cost God much cannot be cheap for us. Above all, it is grace, because God did not reckon his son too dear a price to pay for our life, but delivered him up for us. Costly grace is the incarnation of God. Let us pray that through the amazing grace of God, our hearts may burn within us, giving us the courage and desire to be followers of that straight way, and in so doing, bring others along to walk with us. Solid ground, burned to the face of
Let us join our voices with the ages as we profess our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He had ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We come now to a time of prayer. If we're not ready to listen to the truth, we won't be able to hear it. God has drawn us along many different routes to this shared worship and prayer and listening that we have today. So let's still our bodies and alert our minds and our hearts as we stand in his presence. As I say the words, give us your grace, please respond to hear your word of joy. Give us your grace to hear your word of joy. Heavenly Father, we are only the body of Christ because your spirit binds us together with your life. Give us real concern and love for one another, supportive and encouraging, without malice or bickering, so that we can be sent out strong in our weakness and in our littleness. Give us your grace to hear your word with joy. Heavenly Father, all of the kingdoms and states of the world are answerable to your authority and much evil is allowed to flourish through the silence of good people. Lord, give us all of the courage that we need to speak out your truth, whether it's popular or not. Lord, give us courage to speak. Give us grace to hear your word with joy. We pray, Heavenly Father, be in all our listening at home, on the phone, at school, at work, everywhere. May we give our full attention to you and to one another, happy to grow wiser through each conversation. Give us your grace to hear your word with joy. Heavenly Father, we pray for those whose pain screams silently and incessantly, for those who have no, no one to confide in, no one to listen to. We pray for your love to enfold them, for your peace to calm them, for your healing to transform them, form them. And where it's possible, help us to respond to them with love. Give us your grace to hear your word with joy. Heavenly Father, prepare us all during this life for the life to come. We commend to your keeping all those who've recently made their journey through death to you. And we lift them up to you, those who are on our hearts now. Pray for Ron and Don and, and uh, Philip. Heavenly Father, we thank you for making your ways known to us and guiding us in your truth. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Dear friends in Christ, God is steadfast in love and infinite in mercy. Let us confess our sins, confident in God's forgiveness. Let's observe a moment of silence. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. 
We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sin, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and bring you to everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. May the peace of the Lord be always with you. Well, we just have two announcements in our announcements section today. We want to encourage everybody to pray for our churches as we plan to work and look forward to opening St. Michael's Church and St. George's Church for in-person worship, which we hope will begin in September. We want you to pray for wisdom for our church council and church leaders, and pray for your Holy Spirit's wisdom in all the discussions that take place. Pray that we might learn to worship God in the beauty of the spirit of holiness. Amen. And our second announcement is this, just that we want to hear from you. Please write or call, or um, if you have some, some reason that you want to talk about, like um, a prayer request, or to send us an email, or if you'd prefer to give us a call. Or if you're worried about somebody or something, send us an email so that we can get in touch with you. And if you want to have a talk about anything that you've heard on our service, that you agree with or you wonder about or you disagree with, send us an email, give us a call. We'd love to hear from you and to know what you're thinking. So that would be really great. And one final thing, we're having a cup of coffee at the end of the service. The link is on our, uh, for our virtual coffee room is on our website. So join us and let's have a chat over tea or coffee or whatever it is that you'd like to drink, a glass of water or whatever. And now let's get ready to sing along with our next and last hymn. Maybe you could stand up, might help us all to sing better if we're standing. So here's Heather Jordan to lead us in Let All Things Living Sing. Dear friends in Christ, may the peace of God which passes all understanding keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you this day and remain with you always. Let us go forth to love and serve the Lord. Alleluia.